So let's, uh, we're going to turn and do a little bit of Bible study as well as preaching today. Uh, we are continuing with our series on the gospel according to Luke. And we're back into early Luke. We had a couple sermons introducing Luke, uh, the literary format of Luke Acts, the author, um, and, then, and then a second sermon on a theological sweep, understanding what's going on, a big picture, some big themes throughout specifically the gospel according to Luke. Today, our sermon is look back to look ahead. Now that flows from our scripture for today, but it, looks, it works well for New Year's Sunday. Look back to look ahead, and this is the first part of a, a couple, uh, several sermons actually. Believe before dawn. Are you willing to believe before dawn? Before the sun rises? That's really what's going on. That's the issue at play, uh, in, uh, particularly in Luke chapter 1. So let's pray together, and uh, then we will read some scripture. Oh God, open our hearts to your word that we might... By the power of your Holy Spirit, led by your word, that we would be, Lord, readers and believers in your word, that we would look back in order to look ahead. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we're going to begin with a passage from Genesis chapter 17. In some ways, a central passage in the, in the ongoing development of Abraham's response of faith. We certainly could have turned to Genesis chapter 15, but we're going to go to Genesis chapter 17 for uh, several reasons. Verses 1 through 8, and then 15 through 19. I invite you to hear now God's word. When Avram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Avram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. God calls Avram, Abraham, to be blameless. That I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Avram fell on his face, fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Avram, but your name shall be called Avraham, Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. And I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your seed, your offspring after you, throughout their generations, for an everlasting, everlasting covenant. To be God to you, and to your seed, to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your seed after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Then moving forward to verse 15, and, and God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall call her name, not Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her. And she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face, fell on his face again, and laughed. <laughs> And said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, 
Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And God said, no, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son. And you shall call his name Yitzhak, laughter. And I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his seed after him. And then to Daniel, the prophet Daniel. Verses 20 through 23 of chapter 9 in Daniel. Daniel's speaking. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, and presenting my plea before Yahweh, before the Lord my God, for the holy hill, that means the temple mount, Zion, of my God. While I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, you need to pay attention to that name now, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, that's over in chapter 8 okay, of Daniel, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice, the late afternoon to me. He made me understand speaking with me and saying, O oh, Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. And at the beginning of your pleas for mercy, your tahina, it's not the regular word for prayer there, your pleas for mercy, a word went out. And I have come to tell it to you for you are greatly loved, in other words, by God. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. And then we get the prophecy about the 70 weeks. It's Daniel chapter 9. Now, you may hopefully remember the name Gabriel and sudden appearance at Tamid prayer time from Daniel. You need to pay attention as we go into Luke chapter 1. Verses 5 through 25. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abiah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both upright, righteous before God walking blamelessly in all the commandments and the statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he, Zechariah, was chosen by lot to enter the temple. This is the house. The naos is, uh, is, the, is the Greek word there. Naos. Um, the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. This is the Tamid time. This is when Jesus, by the way, the crucifixion dies. Um, that time on Friday afternoon. And, and there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer, in other words, your prayer for mercy, has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Many, many, not, not all. Many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled 
with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him. In other words, this baby is going to grow up and go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, according to what? It's literally what's said there. How shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah. The priest is supposed to get out of the temple really fast. And they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision inside the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when the time of his service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And for five months, she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. The first century Jewish political historian Josephus describes the Herodian temple that was there, built up over 40 years, and, and there in operation in full glorious display at the time of Zechariah all the way through Jesus. The outer face of the temple was covered, huge stones, now it's huge stones, covered with plates of gold of great weight. And at the first rising of the sun, did you catch that? At the first rising of the sun, the glory of the light reflected back, blinding anyone who would look at the golden plates of the temple as if they were looking at the sun. There was a wall of partition about a cubit height, Josephus says, made of fine stones encompassing the holy house and right there before you get inside the holy house, the ultimate, the brazen altar, the altar of burnt offering. But there was a division that kept the people outside off from the priest. But then these priests, Josephus says, that were without any blemish upon them, went up to the altar clothed in fine linen. That's, that's the burnt offering altar. That's outside. That's not the incense altar. You only get to go do that maybe one time in your entire life inside the house. They, were, they abstained chiefly from wine, Josephus says, out of fear of the Lord, lest they should transgress some rule in their ministry. Now, Josephus then describes what happens when a priest goes in to the house, the naos, the, the temple house. High priest goes in the Holy of Holies once a year, Day of Atonement, and he's in there fast. He's got to get out fast because he's under the fear of the Lord. The other priests maybe get to go in the, into the holy place once a year. I mean, excuse me, once in a lifetime. When a priest entered into the temple, it had three things that were very wonderful and famous among all mankind. The candlestick. Yeah, I've got a visual for you here. The candlestick, the table, and the altar of incense. Now that visual shows you all the way into the Holy of Holies. There's a big curtain, I'll get to that in a minute. Altar of incense, 13 kinds of sweet smelling spices that is as a testimony that God owns everything on the earth. Now in front of Zechariah, inside the holy place would have been the great veil, nearly 
30 feet high of massive thickness and weight, separating the holy place from the most holy place, the holy of holies. And inside the holy of holies, the ark of the covenant, cherubim, wings, a veil, this veil, in Hebrew, the word means separate. It means it separates, okay? There's a total separation here from communion with God inside. That's where he's supposed to be. Woven into the veil, guarding the entrance to the Holy of Holies, were three huge depictions of the cherubim. Josephus tells us it was a massive Babylonian tapestry, priceless. And the, 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 the message, clearly, with having cherubim there, you may remember uh, when Adam and Eve are cast out of the Garden of Eden, the cherubim guard, the, the message here is don't come any closer. So Zechariah is in that place. Uh, both the Talmudic and uh, Mishnaic sources, as well as Josephus and Philo, Philo tell us, you only get that once a year, once in a lifetime, once in a lifetime, once in a lifetime, maybe. You get to go inside and offer the incense offering at the morning prayer time or the late afternoon prayer time. Look back to look ahead. Believe before dawn. You can follow along in the sermon notes. In fact, I encourage you to do that. You'll want to fill in the blanks and um, dig into the scripture as we move on. The main point that I want to make in this message, though, is this. And you can go ahead and fill in these blanks now. We need to do something with God's past amazing grace. I'm using amazing grace today, both because I might use it anyway, but this is the 250th anniversary of the hymn Amazing Grace, which was premiered on January 1st um, by John Newton. So... Uh, do something with God's past amazing grace in fulfillment of his promises to his people and by extension to you. And do something further that he will act now in amazing ways to fulfill his promises for someone's present and future. How do we fill in those blanks? This is the message. This is the takeaway. I hope that even the children get this. We need to remember, remember, big word in the Bible. We need to remember. What does Jesus say we do when we come to the covenant table of the new covenant? We remember him. Okay. Remember, remember God's past amazing grace fulfillment of his promises. Remember doesn't just mean think about it in our head. It means embrace it, live by it. Be totally all in. Remember God's past amazing grace fulfillment of his promises. Believe. Believe that he will act now. Not just 3,000 years ago. Not just 4,000 years ago. Not just 2,000 years ago. I mean now. To fulfill his promises in my, that's for you now, in your own and our present. I mean, 2023. And future. That's the invitation of the gospel. That is faith, living faith, God led faith. To believe that, to remember how God has acted in the past, to remember who God is, to believe in Him, to know Him, and therefore to trust and act boldly in the faith heading into our present and our future. So, looking at this scripture, and particularly we're looking at Luke. Uh, 1, 5 through 25, with reference to the other scriptures I read. The Hebrew name, Zechariah, what does it mean? This is a question that I would normally ask, but I really was bugged by this question, because when you're working with Luke and Luke's gospel, the, the obvious question is, or one question that's begged is, why does Luke want to tell us so much about this scene and tell us so much about how Zechariah failed? I mean, couldn't he just say, well, there's an old priestly couple that God miraculously brought a child to, John, and now let's continue with the story. I got, I got to get to Jesus. Well, why didn't he just have one or two verses? Why is he so into this thing about Zechariah? 
Well, here's one of the keys. What does Zechariah's name mean in Hebrew? It means the Lord remembers. Zakar in Hebrew means remember. Yahweh, Yah. The Lord remembers or causes us to remember. The Lord definitely remembers, but the Lord can cause you to remember too. Do you hear what I'm saying? The Lord, by his spirit, can cause you to remember too. And we're being invited in this passage as New Testament people to move beyond Zechariah's immediate response when God brings him the gospel. It's the first time you get the word gospel in Luke's, you know, account. We just heard it. Gabriel says, I brought you the gospel and you didn't believe it. I brought you the news that God can raise the dead to new life. I brought you the good news that God can bring life where there is totally death. A barren old woman, no problem. Will you believe the gospel? This is, this is what's going on in this passage as far as faith application. This is the preaching point of this passage. The Lord remembers and causes us to remember. Now, remember, as I've already indicated, is a covenant term. For example, in Exodus chapter 2, verse 24, God heard the groaning of his enslaved Hebrew people, his covenant people. He heard their groaning, and God, Exodus 2, 24, remembered. Did God have a memory problem? Is he getting senile? No, that's not what that word means. It's a covenant word, right? God is going to bring back and, and embrace the promises he's made, and he calls us to embrace the promises. God remembered his covenant with all three of the patriarchs, with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob, because he reaffirms it to all of them, just like he told Abraham he would in Genesis 17. Zechariah and Elizabeth represent the Old Testament. It's pretty obvious here. The Old Testament, they're kind of the end of of the previous testament, um, they represent Israel at the point on the verge of Jesus' coming right before dawn. And they represent Israel's faithful remnant. These are people who remain, this little minority of people who remain righteous before God. The prophets talk about them. Isaiah and most of the other prophets talk about the remnant. And God will work through the little burnout, you know, stump and the seed and the stump. This is the remnant. They're part of that. Because Luke tells us they're righteous before God. That doesn't mean before people. That means like God sees them as righteous, okay? Walking blamelessly in all the commandments. But shockingly, barren. Just like Israel hasn't had a prophetic word in nearly four centuries at this point. Just like there's not an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, there's a lot of just dry land. These folks are dry. They're faithful, but dry. And being barren, of course, was regarded as a huge misfortune, not only because of societal things, but spiritually, it cut off your future from the future coming Messiah. Your line is not going to be connected with the Messiah. This is a big deal theologically and spiritually for people who are the remnant, who are righteous before God. And it kind of doesn't make sense. I mean, why, why doesn't, they're, they're righteous. Why doesn't God give them a child? Well, in this case, not always, but in this case, God is going to give these old remnant folks a child. When is this? In the days of somebody who's something of Judea. Well, you ought to be able to fill in the blanks here. In the days of Herod, this is Herod the Great, who built the temple into the wonder, one of the, you know, couple handfuls of wonders of the world. I mean, people came from all over the place to see this amazing way he elaborated the second temple. In the days of Herod, king of Judea. Now, you're supposed to hear that bite because he's not really king. He's not, he's not even Jewish. He's Edomite. He practices Judaism. He's a political operative who's been set up as a puppet king by Rome. This is not anything close to the line of David or the Messiah. <laughs> But he's, he's the boss right now in Judea. 
In the days of Herod, king of Judea, and of course, it's his temple. You've already been hearing me saying this. this is what everybody always refers to as the Herodian temple, Herod's temple. Whose temple is it supposed to be? God's. Now, while Zechariah was serving as priest, verses 8 and 9, before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Again, this is a once in a lifetime. This is the pinnacle of Zechariah's priestly career. He didn't, probably didn't think he was ever gonna get this. He's getting old. But lo and behold, this day, uh, the lots choose four folks, three who assist him, but he's the only one who goes in. He is in the holy place, right in front of the Holy of Holies, right in front of those, that ma massive veil of separation at the altar of incense, right there at the ultimate of the holy place, once in his lifetime, this is the pinnacle of his career. And then, here's how it works. The priest goes in, um, morning or afternoon prayer time, uh, reading this with Daniel and everything else that's going on. I, I interpret this as the afternoon tamid, okay? Um, the tamid means regular, like uh, continual, okay? Tamid, prayers, and offerings. So he goes in and offers incense inside the holy place, which represented what? If you've read the book of Revelation, you know what the incense represents. What does the incense represent? The prayers of the people. And specifically in this case, um, the prayers for mercy or grace from God, the Lord, that he would come, that he would return and bless his people. Pray for communion with God. And then second part of the pinnacle of, of, of a priest's career. Zechariah is going to go in and do the incense offering, the prayers for grace, prayers for mercy of God's communion. Then he comes out, and he, he is the one who's offered the tamid incense offering. He, to close out the day, gives the ironic blessing on all of Israel. I mean, this is the pinnacle of his career. And, 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 of course, the ultimate is to come out and come out after the incense offering and to give that benediction. And his wife is probably saying, now, if you ever get to do this, you need to speak really loudly and clearly so everybody can understand your ironic blessing. Man, this is going to be awesome. So there he goes into the holy place. And you heard what happens. People are waiting outside. You know, he's not supposed to be in there very long. You, know, you get struck by lightning in there. It's like the, when, when you go in on, the, on the, by the way, when the, the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies, as I mentioned, they got a rope tied to him and everything else, and he's supposed to get out fast after sprinkling the blood. He's supposed to get out fast because who knows? You don't dilly-dally around because you're not really in communion with God. You know, this is a fallen situation. So the people are waiting outside, praying in silence and like, is he ever going to come out? Did he die? Did he have a heart attack? He is getting on up in years, isn't he? What happened to him? Did he do some major sin and get struck down by the cherubim, you know, like in person? What happened to him? He's supposed to come out. Finally, he moves outside. But does he get to give the benediction? You tell me. No, he's making all these signs. They, they, they can't figure out what they can figure out. He's given a vision. There is no benediction. We've got to pause on the benediction as we look towards the dawn. So what happened inside? There appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side. That's the good side. That's the favorable side. When Jesus says at the judgment, he will separate the sheep from the goats. Who gets put on the right side? The, the saved ones, the good ones, okay, the chosen ones, okay? So um, this, is, this is an indication. This is propitious. Zechariah was troubled, and fear fell upon him. Gabriel tells him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Now, before I get to that name, notice, he is not, the angel has not told Zechariah, who he is. We, we, you know, Zechariah don't know who this guy is. He knows he's a big stuff. He's there in the temple speaking to him. Gabriel tells him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer, that's prayer for mercy, for grace, for God's blessed coming, God's communion, has been heard. A lot of people read this, that, this is, that, that Zechariah at that day, is praying for a child even in his old age. Based on the way he responds, I do not interpret this passage that way. But God, of course, can hear a prayer you prayed 50 years ago. 
And I'm sure he and Elizabeth prayed a whole lot of prayers for probably a couple decades about a baby. Now, that may be part of what he's saying, but in general what he's saying is your prayer for God to come back to his people, for God to come in the great day of the Lord, it's been answered. And this is big stuff. This is like the dawn of the New Testament, of, of the gospel. Now, let's go back to the name. John, the Hebrew name, Yohanan, Yohanan, what does it mean? It means the Lord is gracious. There is a total scriptural and theological connection here. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? He's praying for grace, the grace of God's coming. And now you're going to have a baby who, by the way, nobody in your family has ever been named this before. It's not an uncommon name, but nobody in your family has it. And it means the Lord is gracious. That's great news. So does Zechariah praise the Lord, raise his hands in, in praise and just go out, you know, just on a high to give the benediction? I, I know that we're at the dawn of the gospel. Well, no. Okay. Let me remind you or, or tell you that there's a special Hebrew word that's a cognate of Yohanan, Tachina. And that is not the standard word for prayer in Hebrew. It means prayer for mercy, to plea, to make supplication for mercy, Tachina. Okay? And that word totally connects with Yohanan. I mean, they're cognates. Gabriel is connecting all this, or God through, Abra through Gabriel is connecting all this. We're supposed to get this message. Back in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel says he was praying, confessing his own sin and the sin of his people, uh, Israel, and presenting Tahanati. Same word there. Daniel is presenting pleas for mercy. He's presenting his own plea for mercy. Same term. It connects to John's name. I, I want y'all to get this now. I think I put it up on the screen so y'all can kind of get this. Okay. Um, so um, in Daniel 9, 23, Gabriel tells him, at the beginning of your pleas for mercy. In other words, the afternoon prayer time. Exactly the time when Zechariah is going to be praying. You know, over 500 years later. Zechariah is going to be in the temple, and Gabriel's basically going to say the same thing. Like he told Daniel, your plea for grace, for God's grace and mercy, has been answered. And he's going to tell Zechariah, your plea for grace, for mercy, for God's coming has been answered. Daniel goes with it, and we lead into the prophecy of the 70 weeks. Um, Zechariah, not so much. Gabriel says, you will have great joy and gladness. Many, notice not all, many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great before the Lord and he must not drink wine or strong drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. A couple of things on that. He's probably Nazarite, a specific kind of oath like Samson was in the Old Testament. But the significant thing here is nobody in the Old Testament. I mean, they're known from their mother's womb. Nobody is filled with the Holy Spirit from their mother's womb. Until John. Jesus says he's the greatest among all those born until the kingdom of God comes among you. And sure enough, this baby is going to be spirit filled, and we're going to see it in Luke's gospel, right? You're, you, I go, or you already know this, right? The baby in the womb leaps when Mary comes bearing Jesus. So, what's going on here? He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him. In the spirit and power of whom? Go ahead and give you the answer to that. Elijah. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. To make a people prepared. In other words, prepared for the Lord's coming. The great day of the Lord. Um, this passage directly connects back with this and tells us we are seeing the fulfillment. That's the answer there. The fulfillment of Malachi 4, 5, and 6. Malachi 4, 5, and 6. How does that go? This is at the end of the Old Testament now. The end of the Old Testament. Malachi 4, 5, and 6. Behold, 
I will send you Elijah the prophet. Wait a minute, he's been, he's been gone for like ages. I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts, you recognize this language? He will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with the decree of utter, utter destruction. Fathers, you spiritually leading? Wives, you? Children, you responding? This is what gospel people do. This is what happens when the New Testament hits, okay? This is going to happen. Malachi 4, 5, and 6 is fulfilled. It's going to be fulfilled. John's going to point to it. He's going to prepare people already in this way, in this way of repentance and conversion unto the Lord. Oh, man, this is so awesome. So now Zechariah is going to say, I get it. I'm a priest. I know the entire Old Testament. I also know Mishnaic uh, teachings. I can get this whole thing. Now I see what you're doing to me. Now I see it. Again, does he raise his hands in praise and just awe at all these biblical connections and everything that God is doing in his present time? No, <laughs> no, not quite. According to what? That's, that's specifically what he was, kata. According to what? Will I, let me just emphasize that, will I know this? I got to understand it. I got to have it down. I got to be smarter than God or at least as smart as God and know exactly what God's doing. You ever do that to God? That's his gut reaction. Even knowing all this scripture. I mean, he knows the story of Sarah and Yitzhak. He knows the story of Manoah and his wife and the miraculous birth of Samson. He knows. He knows the story of Hannah praying for mercy, praying for grace, and receiving Samuel. He knows all this. But does he believe it could happen to him? Do you believe it could happen to you? This is the question of faith. See, Zechariah's unbelief was focused on, I'll go ahead and give you the answers, on himself and his present circumstances and his own power. Look, Gabriel, or look, Angel, Elizabeth and I can't pull this off. I know you can't pull it off. God's going to do it. Bottom line, Zechariah does not believe in the power of God to raise the dead. Central to the gospel. I mean, that's where the gospel is heading. That's where this new dawn is heading. Do you believe that God can raise the dead? I mean, do you believe in your life that God can turn things totally around, raise the dead, bring life out of the midst of death? This is the spiritual issue going on here. This is why Luke's laying all this out for us, I believe. Now the angel answers him. You notice how Zechariah, I, 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 how am I going to understand this? Explain it to me. I've got to be smart enough to understand this. And Gabriel comes back and says, okay, you, you want to talk about I? You want to know who I am? I am Gabriel. I'm one of the seven archangels, and I stand in the presence of God. I'm like the top dog among the archangels. And I was sent, in other words, by God himself to speak to you and bring you this gospel, this good news, and you're not believing it. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place because you do not believe my words, which will be, you know this from my earlier sermon, fulfilled in their time. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized he had seen a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs <laughs> to them and remained mute. Um, when his time of service was ended, he went home. This tells us two things. He doesn't live in Jerusalem. He's not a high-end priest. He's not one of the inside group in the country club. You know, he's an outsider. He lives in a little village in the Judean hills. He's not a highfalutin priest. And secondly, he has now, this, this, this discipline is not only for punishment, but also to confirm the sign and the message. And Zechariah does now do with the, what the faithful thing is. He's old. His wife's old. Can you imagine when he gets home and says, Honey, let's have a second honeymoon. <laughs> what? <laughs> what happened to you in Jerusalem and you can't talk? What's going on? You know, he's like, he's like, you know, he's, he's trying to make signs to her. And then they obviously conceive. And, and by implication, pretty fast. This old, old priest returns to his old wife, unable to speak. And so we get this remedial, amazing thing going on here because God is gracious. He, he, he's not cutting Zechariah out. He's disciplining him to bring him back. You know God can discipline you to bring you back. You know this? 
After these days, Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, The Lord has done for me in the days when he looked upon me to take away my reproach among the people. We'll come back to Elizabeth next week, flowing into Mary next couple weeks. But now let's go back to our key point for today. Look back to look ahead. Believe before dawn. Not just about this year. This is about where you are presently, how you live. What would be your gut reaction? Let's not be too hard on Zechariah before I close out today. Let me ask you this. If I said to you, you know, remember when God spoke and appeared, the Lord appeared with that vision of Constantine, with the Cairo, and said, conquer in this sign? Well, that's exactly what he's doing right now. You say, what? Constantine, what are you talking about? That's, over, that's 1,700 years ago, more than 1,700 years ago. If I said, hey, remember those visions of Edward the Confessor, our king? And his son, Athelstan, you all remember Athelstan, right? I mean, a great man of the Lord for a while. You remember how God worked in his life? And you're sitting there saying, even if you know who these people are, did anybody know who these people are? You're saying, that's, that's over 1,100 years ago. That's back in England. That's Anglo-Saxon stuff. But understand the stories that I'm talking about are that far away from Zechariah and more. Abraham, Samson, Samuel. So don't be too hard on Zechariah, but in turn, I want to invite you to believe that the God who acted 2,000 years ago is alive and well today and can speak to you and speak to us and lead us in new ways now. Now. Remember God's past amazing grace fulfillment of his promises. Believe that he can and will act now in amazing ways to fulfill your present, our present and our future. Final note. You know how I've been scratching at this for a while, Zechariah does not give, give the blessing, right? When are we going to get the full blessing? When are we going to get the full blessing? Well, we get it on the full sunrise New Testament side of the story. This is the close, the close of the gospel according to Luke. Here's the benediction. Then he, this is Jesus, the risen Lord Jesus, then he led them out as far as Bethany and lifting up his hands... He, Jesus, you want to get your blessing from Jesus. He blessed them. There it is. Isn't that amazing? He blessed them. And then what did they do? While he blessed them, he parted from them. This is the ascension and was carried into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple. The action in Luke starts in the temple. It closes in the temple. But now it closes with the benediction of the Lord. So what did they do? They were in the temple blessing God. That's our call for the new year, to bless and praise and bring God's blessing on the earth. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.